Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our audience worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We begin again today with the markets. Stocks swinging all day between gains and losses. Taylor Riggs is here with an update. So it feels like the market's just trying to come to grips with so much uncertainty. Well, and it was interesting. I mean, we've been up at 5 a.m. watching uh, yeah. Limit Up, uh, right? After a 12% crash yesterday, you are up 5% today. And so I was asking a lot of strategists, the f markets seem to be struggling uh, to find a floor, to get that price discovery. Do we shut them down the way we did during 9-11? And most of them adamantly said no, that that creates more panic. Let the markets work these things out for themselves. So then, of course, you get some volatility some up and some down. I normally, and I might regret this decision, uh, uh, talk, I hate talking about the Dow in terms of points, but I do want to come inside my terminal here because when you get 2,000 price swings in either direction, we do need to talk about the Dow in points. Um, as you saw, the, the, the volatility here really pick up. At one point, we had breached that 2,000 level, uh, 20,000 level. Now, of course, coming back up, up against that. Um, so, I think volatility is is here to stay. That might be the least uh, or most consensus thing I could say. You won't regret having said that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's for sure. But it is interesting. I do hear some people on the street, though, actually raise the possibility of closing the markets. Or somebody even suggested today, maybe the SEC should suspend the quarterly earnings report for this quarter because they're not going to be meaningful anyway. Well, that was a very good point. I spoke with Gina Martin-Adams this morning, and she said most companies now aren't even being able to report quarterly guidance. They're just pulling their forecasts yeah. because they even don't know the forecast. So then how do you come out and try to find a forecast for the S&P 500 or an earnings per share growth on a year-over-year -year basis? So there still are, I think, a lot of concerns, and, and we will not get those answers for another month or so until the first quarter ends. We start to get reporting for some of those companies. There are some good winners today. If There are a few that I should mention. Of course, that does remain in the healthcare space. And this was interesting uh, enough, uh, Regeneron is is one healthcare oh. company. They're working with Pfizer on a potential vaccine. They're looking for some human trials early this summer. Moderna, they started a human trial today in Seattle. It's early, it's experimental, but it is an, an early um, uh, a vaccine that they're working on. Uh, so certainly uh, some good news filtering in through these markets as well. Okay, Taylor, thank you so very much. Really appreciate that report on the markets from Taylor Riggs. And now we're going to go out to Chicago and we're going to talk to Dr. Catherine Baker. She is an expert in healthcare policy and she's at the University of Chicago. So, Dr. Baker, thank you so much for joining us. What do we need that we're not getting out of the healthcare system right now? Well, of course, we need to worry about capacity and ensuring that we have the beds and personnel available to treat people who need treatment right away. That's both about expanding equipment that's available and the personnel on call, but also about reducing unnecessary need of the system and making sure that people have the information they need to know when to seek care and when to stay at home and postponing all optional care to make sure the capacity we have is available for treating COVID cases. So, Dr. Baker, Talk to us about the equipment issue, because we've heard this from various sources right now. We had Mr. Trump and the head of AFL-CIO say that he'd gone to the White House and said, we're really short on the production of the necessary equipment for our health care workers to protect them. Where are we on that? I think there's a question of getting equipment to the right place, but then also producing more equipment than we are right now. And there's a real challenge in terms of having people come to work in a safe way to produce more equipment, to be available to care for patients, versus trying to keep people socially isolated and avoiding large gatherings to make sure that we don't further spread the disease. So I think we both need ramped up production, but we also need smarter allocation of getting resources to the right places at the right moment. How difficult is it to produce more equipment? Do you know? I, th I think it varies a lot from equipment to equipment. There are respirators that are specialized equipment that require specialized machinery and expertise to produce. There are basic face masks that are much easier, quicker, cheaper to produce. So I think there's a wide range. What is the risk that we have in this country, if you can assess it, of our turning into something like, if you'll forgive the expression, Italy? Because we've seen that video of the overwhelmed hospitals over there in Italy. Now, as I understand it, yesterday, maybe this the slope is starting to slow a little bit up in Lombardy. But what are the ra risks that we could overwhelm our hospitals just that badly? This is a substantial risk, and of course the actions we take at the individual level and the local level are going to make a huge difference in whether we end up looking like Italy or whether we spread out the cases to be able to have greater uh, ability to meet that with the capacity we have. We need leadership 
of course, to tell us what the right things to do are, but we need local grassroots, individual community-based mobilization to adhere to those recommendations, and that's choices that individuals make every day, every minute to slow transmission. And if we if we can do that, there's a real hope that we don't look like Italy. But if we don't, I think that's the direction we're heading. Fascinating. And of course, that's why we have the quarantines going to affect, the lockdowns going to affect, the curfews going to affect to try to effectuate exactly what you're talking about. Uh, at the same time, we had the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, come out over the weekend and then an op-ed in the New York Times today say, we need the Army Corps of Engineers to come in and start building hospital uh, capacity. Is that realistic? I don't know what timeline that's realistic in. Expanding capacity seems well warranted. The, to the extent that we can slow down the transmission of the disease, that also means that we have more time to build up capacity, but that these measures will be with us for a longer time. So that's the real cost that we pay to save the human lives and suffering that's spreading out the cases would effectuate. Yeah, the ca capacity, of course, is not just physical capacity, but human capacity in healthcare workers. What did we learn from the Chinese experience about how big the risk is, frankly, for healthcare workers in dealing with some of the patients? That, that goes back to the question of safety equipment and space to spread people out. Of course, when we talk about capacity, as you note, it's not just the hospitals. You can build a hospital very quickly, as we saw in China, but it takes much longer to train or grow a doctor or a nurse or a healthcare worker. So having uh, equipment available so that the healthcare workers can protect themselves because we can't afford for them to fall ill and having a little bit more room to care for cases so that there's slower transmission both among patients and from patients to healthcare workers is vital for maintaining that healthcare worker capacity that we so desperately need. Catherine, we have a, a fairly decentralized healthcare system in this country. Uh, a lot of it's done at the state and local level. Who needs to exercise leadership? Do we need to rely upon the local level or can it come from the federal government or the state? I think we need reliable, robust information to come centrally. I don't think we can have individual health systems trying to forecast transmission rates, trying to understand the evolution of the disease. So we need those reliable central sources and guidance from the federal government and federal officials. But then implementation of reaction to those guidelines has to happen at the local level. Because, as you know, we're so decentralized. There are more than 50 Medicaid programs. There are so many different health insurers with overlapping populations and then independent hospitals and hospitals in chains and physicians who are associated with different systems that we need decentralized uh, levers to adhere to those best practices, but we need as much guidance as we can centrally with reliable information about what best practices are. That's very helpful to understand. Thank you so much, Catherine, for being with us. That's Catherine Baker. She's Dean of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. And now it's time to turn to Washington and Kevin Cerulli, our chief Washington correspondent. He is on the phone at the moment. So, Kevin, give us a sense. We were waiting for the Senate to pass this bill that would basically extend sick pay and pay for tests and things like that. Now Political IC has a report that maybe the White House is thinking about combining that together with the $850 billion stimulus coming out of the Treasury Department. What do we know? $850 billion. That's uh, according to sources that I've been on the phone with virtually all morning as we continue uh, to try to figure out the timetable, David, for the economic stimulus. But $850 billion is the number in terms of the economic stimulus now that the president and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, as well as Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, are trying to grapple with. There are a couple of issues, though, in terms of not necessarily political sticking points, but in terms of executing when precisely this stimulus would most likely be needed. Because right now, the argument for, for the timetable is if everyone's hunkering down for at least the next two weeks, injecting so much liquidity into the markets, would that be even needed in the sense would, would everyday consumers be able to go out and purchase it if their stores are open? So that's one issue that they're grappling with. Secondly, it is worth noting to see how different states are responding to this. California Governor Gavin Newsom, David, he has uh, issued a temporary relief period for individuals on paying their mortgages. He's required that the uh, utilities agencies be issuing weekly uh, reports to, so that folks can gain confidence that their utilities are going to go on. Uh, and so 
every state really grappling with various ideas for how to maintain this economic confidence at a very uncertain time. Uh, and, and as of the, the legislation that is making its way through Congress that would, uh, again, make the test free uh, for the coronavirus, as well as uh, two weeks of paid sick leave, that, I'm told, as you just said, is virtually round-the-clock conversations between Speaker Pelosi, Leader McConnell, and the Treasury Department. Okay, Kevin, thank you so much for the reporting from Washington. That's our chief Washington correspondent, Kevin Cirilli. And now we turn to Viviana Hurtado. She is here with Bloomberg First Word News. David, we begin with U.S. retail sales. They fell last month by the most in a year. They were down one-half of 1%. 1 it's a sign consumer spending began to slow this before the coronavirus hit the economy. This month's numbers are likely to show a deeper decline. New York Mayor Bill de Blasio says the city may be forced to impose a shelter-in-place order that would require all residents to confine themselves in their homes. This to contain the spread of the coronavirus. The mayor telling CNN he couldn't rule it out, but New York Governor Andrew Cuomo says he has no plans to do so. Now to Saudi Arabia, the kingdom is escalating its oil price war with Russia. The Saudis will start exporting more than 10 million barrels a day starting in May. That's the most ever. The fight sending the price of Brent crude down below $30 a barrel. It's forced energy companies to announce big spending cuts. And we end with American pro football and Tom Brady leaving the New England Patriots. The quarterback who led the Pats to six Super Bowl titles became an unrestricted free agent. He tweeted today his football journey will take place elsewhere. Mr. Brady is 42 years old. He played 20 seasons for the Pats. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Viviana Tondo. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Viviana. Coming up, many grocery store shelves are empty. We talk with the head of one of the largest food wholesalers in the country, Steve Spinner of United Natural Foods. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. People across the country have been rushing to supermarkets to stock up on food and other supplies in anticipation of possible quarantines. United Na National Foods is a nationwide wholesaler distributor of groceries and other home supplies. And we welcome now its CEO. He is Stephen Spinner joining us over the telephone. So welcome, Mr. Spinner. Great to have you with us. Give us a sense of how uh, stressed the system is out there because a lot of people report going to supermarkets and not finding what they want on the shelves. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, David, and really appreciate uh, putting me on this morning. And as you said, UNFI is the largest wholesaler of food across every category of what you would typically find in a supermarket. With 59 distribution centers, we send out over 2,000 trucks a day, keeping the food supply chain moving with over 200,000 products, delivering to over 30,000 retailers. It's very likely if you've been to a grocery store and you have product in your home, that that product flowed through one of our warehouses. I can tell you, as you might imagine, the demand is through the roof, and I'm so incredibly proud of our team. They take their role in this crisis so seriously, and they recognize the important role they play in ensuring that our consumers continue to get access to the much-needed products. So uh, we're operating as a company with safety uh, at the forefront of everything we do. And Listen, we're urging everyone to buy responsibly to ensure that there's product uh, for everyone. We're communicating regularly with state and local and federal offices, including FEMA and USDA, to ensure that the supply chain for food retailers remains intact. Uh, but we have a seat at the table to keep America fed. And for perspective, the volume that we're doing, uh, certainly over the last couple weeks, is considerably greater than the volume that we did in our busiest week last year, which was the week... Uh, prior to Thanksgiving. Our folks are coming to work. Knock on wood, to this state, we haven't anybody test positive for the virus. Um, and we're getting, we're getting the job done to the best of our ability. So, so insofar as there are shortages in some places, that is to say we don't find things on the shelves, is that because we don't have enough food or other products to put there? Is it because we have trouble distributing it? Or is it just getting it stocked onto the shelves because people are taking it off so fast? Yeah, so listen, product is available. The manufacturers are working. The retailers are working. The supply chain is working. We have inventory. Now, obviously, there are categories that are shorter on allocation, as you might expect, 
paper supplies, sanitizing, disinfecting um, type materials are, are really tight and will likely be tight for quite some time. But food is available. I think that the, the, the difficulty is getting it out into the retailer's hands and ultimately out into the consumer's hands just because of the constraint in the supply chain, the workforce, uh, in order to do that. But, you know, truckers are coming to work. Uh, unions are helping. Our teams are helping. Non-union folks are helping. And quite honestly, you know, in some of the markets where demand is on its way down, uh, we're working closely with our friends in other industries to put their folks to work as well. And what about regionally? Is there a geographic difference about uh, supply of food and other products? No, uh, the demand is skyrocketed throughout every single geography in the U.S. and Canada. Well, and so I know you've been talking with the White House. Uh, what are you telling them and what are you hearing back from them? Yeah, so we, we like I said earlier, we have a seat at the table. Um, we're, we're telling them to keep the roads open. The manufacturers, the wholesalers, the retailers are working as essential workforce. Uh, ensure the state's. Uh, play their part um, and keep the states aware of the need to ensure that these essential workers don't get confused by sheltering at home or curfews. And I think two more comments I'll make is uh, to encourage the consumers to buy responsibly. Hoarding is just not going to help. It's just going to further complicate the supply chain. Food is available, and as long as we can get it out the door, select it on the truck and into the retailers, we're going to be in good shape. Now, it may be in different packs and sizes, different brands, different flavors, but there is product available, and we will get it to the shelf. I know also from a consumer perspective with a lot of the city schools uh, closing or have closed that certainly the government needs to expand SNAP and EBT in order to make funds available for those folks who need it. So, Mr. Spinner, you said that the demand is up substantially. Uh, maybe you could quantify that for us, but how long can you keep this going? Everybody is having to do worst-case scenarios right now and planning out. Can you keep this going all the way through the second quarter, for example? Yeah, I think we have to. Uh, we've got contingency plans in place through our 59 distribution centers. We're getting access to additional workforce um, in those industries where the workforce, where the demand is declining. Um, and that's terrific. I think Americans generally rise to the occasion, and we're certainly seeing that around our distribution centers and other industries and, and with, our, with our union friends. Um, so uh, the answer is, yeah, I, I think that the product will remain available. Uh, we've got to give our workforce some rest, which we're working on doing. Um, but ultimately, I think that we will rise to the occasion and we'll see it through. How do you make sure you're not spreading the disease? I mean, this is not just true for you, but for all sorts of different uh, companies right now who, by their very nature, have to go to various locations. They go from place to place to place. You could pick it up any single place. You said, fortunately, you don't have any workers testing positive at this point. But what precautions are you taking to make sure that in visiting one supermarket, you're not picking up the virus and delivering it to a second? Yeah, I mean, listen, safety is first and foremost to us. We have very rigid business continuity plans, very rigid standard operating procedures around cleanliness and hygiene and social distancing. We're doing a lot of things that I'm sure you've heard of in uh, office buildings in terms of uh, uh, getting the work depth force way down in the buildings, especially in the buildings where we have to stay open. We continue to prioritize. Uh, advanced food safety, temperature control, point-to-point -point supply chain, hygiene, disinfecting, social distancing, as I said earlier. The majority of our products are packaged and therefore not susceptible to contamination. We're doing a lot of education with our drivers. We're doing a lot of education with our uh, warehouse associates and our office associates, and I know our retailers are doing the same. So as long as we follow those guidelines, I think that we will terrifically minimize the risk of contamination. Okay, Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. That was really interesting and informative. That's Stephen Spinner. He's the CEO of United Natural Foods. Still ahead here, the latest on the market. Stocks are near session highs now as hopes rise for a response out of Washington. This is Bloomberg.
This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. It's time now to get a check on the markets, given all they've done, down, up, down, up. Kayla Lines is here to explain all to us. When I woke up early this morning, they were limit up. And then they right. went into the red, and then they started to eat their way back up, and now they're doing all right at the moment. They are, but volatility, of course, is the name of the game. I mean, you're still looking at around an 80 handle on the VIX. We are right around all-time record highs. And as you say, stocks are now up about 4%. We know how quickly that narrative can change. For the moment, though, it is a risk on tone. I think you're seeing some optimism, both on the fact that the Fed is restarting this commercial paper facility. That eases some concerns about companies' ability to get kind of short-term credit there, and potentially maybe some stimulus coming out of D.C. Mnuchin taking that $850 billion spending package to the Hill. We'll see if that comes to fruition, but there may be some optimism on more spending coming from the U.S. government. I mean, that's moving faster than I think people would have thought. Right. I mean, you know, they were talking about some sort of stimulus, but actually they're talking to the Republican senators today mm -hmm. about possibly doing something. At the same time, part of that stimulus reportedly is going to be the airline industry, and airlines have had a really tough time with IATA today coming out saying worldwide it could be $200 billion. Yeah, and here did. in the U.S., reportedly, airlines are asking for nearly $60 billion. Right. I would say that if you look at airline stocks today, they don't seem to be believing that stimulus is coming anytime soon. I'm looking at stocks like United down about 6%. And then Boeing, which also has asked for help for the U.S. government, is down by 14 That stock is actually at its lowest now since all the way back in 2013. So you're seeing them asking for help. The question is, will they get it? And the question is, even if the U.S. government helps them with short-term liquidity here, they are still facing a demand collapse that many on the street say is going to be worse than 9-11. And even funding aside, there is a question of when exactly demand is going to recover. Exactly. It's not just right now getting paid for aircraft, but it's not clear there's going to be that kind of air demand going out. Same problem for hotels, as a matter of fact, and, and cruise lines, goodness knows. We've got some real tourism issues here. Absolutely. For travel stocks, and then even beyond that, for the likes of retailers, restaurants, those are some of the worst performing stocks in the S&P 500 today because you have cities across the U.S. telling people to stay where they are, restaurants shutting down, people not going to malls. You are seeing stocks like Darden restaurants down by nearly a quarter today. L Brands is off by 30 percent. And this wow. is after the worst day for the apparel sector ever yesterday. Wow. Those losses just continue. OK, thank you so much for that report on the markets from Kelly Lines. Up next, responding to a global pandemic, we speak with Brock Long. He's former FEMA administrator about the measures the U.S. is taking and what more it can do. This is Bloomberg. From New York, this is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. President Trump on Friday declared a national emergency, and in doing so, he specifically enlisted the help of FEMA in responding to the growing crisis caused by the coronavirus. Welcome now the former administrator of FEMA, Brock Long, served under President Trump, having earlier run Alabama's Emergency Management Agency. He is now executive chairman of Haggerty Consulting, which advises on how to handle emergencies, and we welcome him now to Bloomberg. Thank you so much for being with us. It's good to have you. Give us a, sense of, give us a sense of what FEMA can do. You know FEMA. The president says he wants to use FEMA. What sorts of things could FEMA do? I know it, nat it usually it handles natural disasters. This is something different. Right. So for public health emergencies, which is what has been declared along with a national emergency, there's two separate things. FEMA plays a very vital role behind the scenes. So right now, HHS and the CDC are basically the primary agencies in charge uh, uh, and, and playing incident the, the role of incident command. FEMA is a secondary responder, and they're providing uh, planning, technical expertise. They will be providing, under the new emergency de declaration, uh, reimbursement for state and local expenditures to the response. Uh, but they also help with playing a vital role in coordinating logistical movements of testing kits to uh, future vaccines. What have we learned from past disasters that could be applicable here from your experience? Because, as I say, you, you did this job at Alabama and then at the federal level. Well, unfortunately, our nation does not have a true culture of preparedness, and it's something that um, I implemented as one of the priorities while I was FEMA administrator, and it's still a priority. You know, the first goal of FEMA is to create a true culture of preparedness, which doesn't exist. You know, we have to instill financial stability into people. We have to instill that insurance is the first line of defense and just an overall level of readiness and, and uh, you know, Per, you know, personal action is what's most important. Neighbor helping neighbor is what's most important. Um, the federal government and a response cannot make cannot make people home. Can't make households whole. Um, you know, after a disaster, and so you have to be able to control your own destiny to the to the to the degree that you can, rather than being reliant on federal aid. 
in this case, you know, the biggest thing going on today, um, everybody needs to be heeding the 15 days. Um, you know, I hear a lot of talk about how is the virus in my community? There's only so many cases in this state or that state. We all need to pretend that the virus is here and in our communities and heed the warnings, because if we don't, then more drastic action would need to be taken by the federal government in, in, in weeks to come. What about assessing the level of damage? Uh, I, I assume in FEMA, when you have a hurricane come through, the first thing to do is figure out, okay, how many people are displaced, how much damage has been done, things like that. Uh, that sort of leads into testing here. Do we need to get our arms around the testing and get that done and really know how big a problem we have? Well, here again, um, the virus is with us regardless of the test. Yeah. We have to act like it is here and take those, uh, take those precautions. The test will give epidemiologists you know, obviously more critical data that they need to understand if the virus is transmitting at a greater rate or, or curving off in the future. Um, you know, r right now, uh, again, it goes back to heeding the warnings, making sure that we're doing the things that we're being asked to do. So that's, that all is very sensible, important advice on trying to limit what is, frankly, right now, an unknowable extent of this virus. As you say, makes good sense. Just assume it's everywhere. Uh, don't, don't be trying to be right. cute about where it is and where it isn't. At the same time, we are warned, for example, by the governor of New York, uh, uh, Andrew Cuomo, that we may be overwhelmed with our hospitals. Is that something that FEMA could help with? Yeah, so, so um, here's the thing about the hospital system and all of the separation tactics. In my opinion, the, separate, the greatest need of the separation tactics is to push back the tipping point of when our hospitals could potentially collapse. There is only so much personal protective equipment that, that is readily available to these hospitals. FEMA would help with logistical movement of what's known as the strategic national stockpile to move you know, uh, a, 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 an additional tranche of personal protective equipment to hospitals as needed. But here again, these are not new resources that are constantly being restocked. And so the supply chains that support the, you know, our public health industry are incredibly weak, which is something that we got to go back in and bolster in the future as an after action. But the separation tactics are designed to push the tipping point back to delay, you know, the, the number of people and reduce the number of people that will actually be having to go to hospitals to seek attention. Yeah, no, no doubt. I think anybody's mind. The best defense here is to get have fewer people with the virus, and that goes back to staying at home and not uh, not associating with other people too closely. All those sort of things. But at the same time, we could have a real problem here. Again, coming back to Governor Cuomo, just because he's written about the New York Times today, he said that maybe we should have the Army Corps of Engineers step up and try to build some new hospitals. We saw China on uh, Wuhan build that hospital in no time at all. Is that feasible? Did you ever use the Army Corps of Engineers for something like that? Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is an integral part of the National Response Plan framework. Um, you know, it, it's never been done. Look, we're charting new ground. I mean, there's unprecedented separation tactics being implemented by not only by the federal government but at the state and local level. FEMA does have contracts and logistical contracts for temporary housing and, um, you know, shelters in, in tent cities, that types of things. But here again, we've got to make sure that we're deploying those uh, in the right manner. Now, look, all disasters are federally supported, state managed, and locally executed. So a lot of the activity, you know, governors and, you know, municipal leaders can control their own destiny. They should be taking the actions that they see that they need to take to take care of their citizens and not waiting on the federal government to do things. The federal government largely plays a reimbursement role. Uh, and then helping states and local governments to fill any gaps that they may have, whether it's resources, people, technical expertise, or funding to pay for this. And so I think that might be, you know, that's something that's being lost, is governors and local, local uh, decision makers should be doing what they think they need to do uh, in conjunction with guidance from the CDC, but taking care of their own communities and not waiting on the federal government. Talk to us about corporations. Uh, at Haggerty, you advise companies on how to deal with crises. Uh, what is your advice that you're giving to your customers right now about what they can and should be doing as a corporation? Right now, we're, we're really having to advise a, a number of our clients and you know, particularly the private sector clients on continuity of operations. Um, how do businesses continue to meet their mission of critical, uh, you know, mission critical essential functions when they're facing a crisis like a virus, when they have staff reductions, when they can't get their hands on necessary resources that they need to push their products and services to other people? Um, what do they do if they're denied access to their building or if um, more drastic measures are taken to lock down in the future? You know, these are elaborate plans, but, you know, 
unfortunately, a lot of businesses, whether they're small or large, you know, multi-billion dollar companies, they don't want to spend the time on the blue sky day when nothing's happening or the overhead to develop these plans. And they take a bigger hit as a result of going through these disasters. They're more, they're more vulnerable to these types of disasters. And so what we're trying to do is advise our community, you know, our customers on how to basically reduce the impacts and sustain, you know, sustain their mission and meet their mission essential functions uh, while we're all going through this together. Let's come back to what you said about the, the state role in this and the local uh, role in this. We're seeing increasingly restaurants close down, for example, bars close down, uh, restaurants you can only do takeout, carry out. Uh, given what you said about that we have to do everything to do try to slow down or stop this virus, should we nationally be shutting all the restaurants and the bars? You know, I can't answer that question. I mean, obviously, the small businesses in this country are the essence of our communities, and this is going to be a much tougher financial hit for them to to be able to overcome, and that's that's really tough. We're going to have to find ways of, you know, trying to continue to produce a revenue under different circumstances, which is not easy. Um, but right now, you know, the goal is saving lives and protecting people. And so the, this movement of 15 days is necessary, again, to push back the tipping point or breaking point of our hospital systems, but then also making sure that we slow the spread so that more drastic action doesn't have to be taken in the future. If you could give one piece of advice, and this could be the federal level, the state level, or the local level, to say, do this differently from what you're doing right now, what would it be? Uh, Pretend that the virus is in your community and, um, you know, practice good hygiene, wash your hands, take care of, you know, check on your neighbors, man. Love your neighbors as you love yourself is the key theme here, you know, and um, realize that, hey, this virus may not impact you uh, severely, but you could pass it along to others that could be compromised uh, and actually die from this from this virus. So. Love your neighbors, you love yourself, take care of each other, and uh, heed the warnings. Yeah, it's not a bad rule for life, the golden rule. <laughs> it works out in an awful lot of different situations. But do you think we're doing everything we can do right now? You know, right now, I think we're trying to strike the right medium. Um, you, you know, look, hey, you know, it's uh, the federal government's in a tough spot, you know, when it comes to if you lock down the whole country, you know, several things collapse. And then, you know, people are ridiculed for doing way too much or overkill. You know, if we had done this over a month ago, we would have been accused, you know, the federal government would have been accused of overkill. So right now it's trying to strike the right balance, but, you know, flatten what, what we call flatten the curve on the, the virus distribution or infectivity rate.